Good morning. My name is Kent. I am the care pastor and director of Community Life here. If we hadn't had a chance to meet yet, it's a pleasure, joy to be with you today to share God's word with you. A couple of miles northwest of the city of Jericho, we can see a place called the Mount of Temptation. A Greek Orthodox monastery marks it among the mountains and the cliffs. We see here that the wilderness is not an expanse of sand with the occasional cactus and tumbleweed. It's a place where the footing is treacherous. A slip could mean a devastating fall or deadly injury. It's a sort of place for snakes and scorpions. It's no wonder the tradition held that demons and evil spirits lurked up in there. It's a place that people avoided. Tradition holds this is where the Holy Spirit led Jesus after he was baptized by John. The Gospel of Matthew says Jesus experienced suddenly the heavens were open to him and he saw God's Spirit descending like a dove alighting on him and he heard a voice speak. And then the next thing we know, Jesus is led by the Spirit into these dangerous cliffs to be tempted by the devil. Some people wonder why the Spirit would lead Jesus to such a place. Why not something easier? Let's let that question lead us to why we're reading this story today. We're entering a season where we are intentional about asking questions and opening ourselves to deeper relationships. And often, such a focus will lead us to feel like we need to do something, to give or to act in Jesus' name. We, we talk about this during Lent, right? Let's, we'll give up something for Lent. Or we'll add something in service or devotion. However, doing something may not always answer all of our questions. There may be something more to learn about ourselves, who we are. In the novel Ordinary People, there's a character going through a crisis. He keeps overhearing conversations that begin, now I'm the kind of man who, and he leans in and he tries to listen to see if he can find something for himself in this season of of feeling confused and adrift. But there's nothing for him. And finally he admits, I'm the kind of man who hasn't the foggiest idea what kind of man I am. In his wilderness test, Jesus examines the revelation of his baptism where he is given an identity. A voice from heaven says, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. In the wilderness, truly tempting voices will challenge what he heard about who he is. We are told Jesus listened in the wilderness to these powerful words from heaven by fasting. Some of you may remember that fasting is the epiphany star word that chose me about eight weeks ago. In my study, I discovered that fasting is a response to a serious sacred moment. It's natural and inevitable to fast because the sacred moment generates a fasting response. And through fasting, the sacred moment is given full power in our human lives. So let's listen to Jesus' response to the sacred moment of his baptism and his identity. I'm reading this morning from the Gospel of Matthew, beginning at chapter 4. Let's listen for God's word for us this day. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. 
Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. On March 24, 1996, Leon Weissettler's father died. Leon was 44 years old and an editor for New Republic magazine. Now, long before this, he had left behind the faith of his childhood. But with the loss of his father, he made a choice to start praying. Wherever he was, three times a day, morning, noon, and evening, he prayed the same prayer. Three times a day, every day, the same prayer for a year. May God's God's great name be blessed forever and ever. Blessed, praised, glorified, exalted, extolled, mighty, upraised, and lauded be the name of the Holy One. Blessed is God. As you see and hear, this prayer is not about grief or pain, loss nor woundedness. It's speaking about God, God's greatness. Three times a day, every day for one year. May God's great name be blessed. May God's great name be blessed. May God's great name be blessed. This is an ancient prayer based on several verses of Scripture. Many speculate that Jesus would have known it. Scholars have found when it's read in Jesus' first language, Aramaic, there are many similarities between it and the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Now, through this year of prayer, Leon found he could not separate his prayer from the rest of his life. He could not insulate his life from the prayer. He wrote this, The symbols of the prayers were seeping into everything in my life. A season of sorrow became a season of soul renovation. Soul renovation feels like something many of us are seeking especially in these turbulent times that we're living. May the renovation of our souls be found in praying, even if prayer seems ancient and obscure to us. The Gospels are clear that Jesus prayed, that he knew Scripture, that he traveled, visited synagogues synagogues where he preached. I find that hard to believe that that all started the day he was baptized. The Gospel of Luke us to Jesus' childhood connection to worship and twice tells us that Jesus grew in wisdom, I think it's fair to say that through his life, he heard the scriptures, it is written, it is written, it is said. He rehearsed prayers, may God's great name be blessed. He learned the Psalms, the Lord is my shepherd. And after 40 days in the wilderness, famished, pushed against the wall by the devil, when his calling and his loyalty to God and his very identity are pressed to the limits by the tempter's counter-proposals to live not as one who serves and trusts God, but one whose energy and life are spent serving himself and demanding proofs of God, Jesus answers with the truths he had learned through the practices, repetitions, the disciplines of his faith. One doesn't live by bread alone. Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. The words that served him well in the wilderness were engraved upon his heart. Most of us, I believe, know wilderness places as well. They're not all outside somewhere. The footing of life can be treacherous in hospital rooms, in bedrooms, in cars, and offices. Sometimes the wilderness is in the middle of the chest when we're begging from a word from God and we hear nothing back but the, the sound of our own breath. We sometimes feel the wilderness in a tight band around our heads when there are severe choices, decisions, and concerns. When life presses us to the wall, 
and we find only Bible-quoting devils and too many dusty old stones, what do we have in our wilderness places? Carl Jung wrote, when we must deal with problems, we instinctively resist trying the way that leads through obscurity and darkness. We wish to hear only unequivocal results and completely forget that these results can only be brought about when we have ventured into and emerged again from the darkness. I propose that Jung's obscurity and darkness are similar to parallel with biblical wilderness and temptation. Our wilderness places may be where we find transformation to a greater alignment with our true identity, our deeper nature, our calling in life. As Jung wrote, we often want to resist that path. The temptation is to say we can be or accomplish whatever it is we set our minds to. We don't need others. We don't need divine mystery. We don't want God. We don't want community. We'll just bear the pain. We just want to get thrown with life. But there persists the discontent, an uneasy spirit. No matter how hard we try to tamp it down, no how much we listen to the voices of our culture, which is drunk on the ideology that we're masters of our own destiny. There is a human yearning for a deeper sense of meaning and purpose, a leading away from our current approach to life that feels like ego-killing obscurity and darkness and wilderness. It may feel treacherous like death because it is a sort of death. So what do we have there? It is written, it is written, it is written. You are my child, the love with whom I am well pleased. You are my child, the loved with whom I am well pleased. You are my child, the loved with whom I am well pleased. I believe that true for all of us whether we're new to church, whether we're feeling hurt or estranged from the community, or we're seasoned but we're still wanting and feeling the need for growth. So which voices will we listen to? May our pain and temptation be places for listening and awakening, the places for opening our minds and hearts to a new way of being, new identity, connecting to our deeper nature, our calling to be more in line with the more, most divine against the brokenness of the world. After reciting the ancient prayer three times a day for a year, Leon went with his family and friends to the cemetery to dedicate his father's grave. It was a cold, windswept day. He was invited to read a psalm, but instead he sang, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He wrote, My song grew as if to make room within it for everyone gathered around it, to shield them with its splendor and to seal them with its peace. Then there was one thing left to do. Standing there in the icy cemetery, looking at his father's grave, the space between faith and doubt, he recited the prayer once more. May God's great name be blessed forever and ever. Blessed, praised, glorified, exalted, extolled, Mighty, upraised, and lauded be the name of the Holy One. Blessed be God. In that sacred moment, looking down upon the grave and up to heaven, he was surprised to find the kind of person that he was, sanctified and magnified through the rhythm of prayer. Soul renovation indeed. The prayer is printed in your bulletin. And I invite you to add it to your journey through this season, three times a day, every day, until we get to Easter. May each of our journeys be a time to seek and to recall, to find our growth edges and the habits and resources of our hearts, along with questions and answers that will yield hope and promise. May we find upon reflection the Spirit's leading, drawing us into the fullness of life and to the heart of the Holy One. And may we be shielded with splendor and sealed by peace. And may we, in the simplest of terms, 
come to know our identity given by God. You are my child, beloved, and with you I am pleased. Amen.